Welcome. I'm Dick Gooding, and I'm your host for today's edition of Veterans Remember, where I'm having the opportunity to meet with a number of veterans from Hopkinton and, and folks who are related to people in Hopkinton who share their experiences of service, some in war, some not. But uh, uh, we hope that this will give people an opportunity to look at these videos and to really get an opportunity to see uh, what our soldiers and our veterans have done to protect you uh, uh, in the future. Uh, today I'm joined by Lieutenant Colonel Dan Pincava of the U.S. Air Force you know, on active duty. And this is our second session with Dan. And Dan uh, uh, enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1985. He was selected for warrant officer flight candidate training at Fort Rucker, Alabama in 1987 where he learned to fly Army helicopters. Warrant Officer Pincava earned his Bachelor of Science in Professional Aeronautics from Embry-Riddle University in 1992. Dan then received his commission as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army as a graduate of Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia in 1993. In 1995, First Lieutenant Pincava transferred to the U.S. Air Force, where he continued his service to the United States as a helicopter pilot. Lieutenant Colonel Pincava has held a wide range of operations, training, and acquisition positions in joint service operations. He is trained on all combat helicopter equipment and has had multiple deployments in U.S. combat operations since 1991. Lieutenant Colonel Pincava is currently assigned as flight commander with the 950th Electronic Systems Group at Hanscom Air Force Base. Please join me in welcoming back Lieutenant Colonel Dan Pincava to Veterans Remember. Dan? Sir, thank you for having me back. Thank I appreciate you. the time. When we uh, uh, met the last time that you were here, uh, you, you really walked us through your, uh, uh, the beginning stages of your military career and uh, brought us up to your times in the Army after, after you'd gone to Warrant Officer Training School and then uh, to OCS for uh, your commissioning with the U.S. Army. Uh, as we continue to march along your career, I'm sure you've had some pretty exciting things you might want to share with us as part of that before you left the Army and moved into the Air Force. Uh, Dick, thank you for that lead, and I appreciate it. Uh, uh, if you haven't uh, seen the first cut, uh, I just want to say thank you to all the other veterans that uh, allowed me to have the opportunity to continue serving. Uh, it is a, a, a matter of choice. And since we are the greatest nation in the world and we have such responsibility, um, that uh, deed is, is not taken lightly. And um, the young people out there, it's a great uh, opportunity to live, learn, uh, get college, and actually remember citizenship, what citizenship means. Uh, it's lost sometimes. Uh, it's not taught anymore. But uh, citizenship is, is very important. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I just wanted to uh, take up where I left off. The, uh, as you mentioned, I, I have a, a, a salad mixing bowl type of career. It's not standard. Uh, I've made some life choices. I've made some decisions to move from one uh, known entity to another. Uh, however, uh, they were... Uh, in my decision, they were the best thing that I could do to continue to being a, 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 a citizen warrior so I can continue to stay on the leading edge. Uh, uh, I wasn't done with uh, uh, finding out who I was and, and my capabilities as an uh, uh, officer, a soldier, an a airman in the military. But we we'll go back to the Army. The Army was fun. Uh, as a warrant officer, I was uh, I transitioned out of flight school into the AH-1 Cobra, the family of Cobras, which is an attack helicopter uh, that got its uh, spurs in your time. Certainly uh, had a lot of a lot of help from Cobras when I was in Vietnam, uh, and and we've uh, continued to modernize that. And uh, my exploits from the Army will uh, be centered around uh, Desert Storm. Um, that that was a. The best of times, worst of times. Uh, I think um, anybody that has been in, uh, engaged in combat or even just leaving their family uh, for the uh, possibility of combat, uh, 
you're left with a um, a sense of wonderment. And the reason why I say that is because the emotions that are flooding in upon you when you step on that tarmac and get on that uh, big bird to go wherever you have to go, if it's 18 or 24 hours later, your feet down and doing your mission, uh, it's kind of uh, strange to know that, wow, have I done the best thing for my children? Is my will in order? Um, have I uh, written enough letters to the people that I love? Have I taken care of those type of issues to give me some legacy if I'm uh, unfortunate uh, to not make it back? Those things you're, you're left with, and I think it's important to state that. It's part of being um, an airman, a marine, a sailor, a soldier. That is something that we miles get used to. Everybody seems to want what we want, what we have in America. Um, but anyways, Desert Storm was funny. I can look back and laugh now. Um, I was a, a young war officer in uh, Fort Drum, New York, uh, stationed there. Uh, as you remember, uh, the buildup, the hype was huge, uh, uh, and, and rightfully so. I think the opposing force had over a million-man army, uh, and we were in the process of, of starting to slow down our, our recruitment and then uh, reduce our, our numbers. Uh, so that had some other challenges. Uh, I remember getting on a 141, a C-141 out of uh, Griffiths Air Force Base. It was uh, the January time frame. It was probably minus 20 degrees. Uh, being shackled, not really shackled, but you, you get in a sterile room, you got your stuff, and it's just, you know, make sure there's no contraband going into the country. You, you know, you, you're, you're ready to go. Get up, walk out. You can say goodbye to your wives, your friends, your families, who, who was ever there at that time. Uh, and you get on the bird, and then you're 18 hours later, you're in another country. Uh, we we uh, landed in uh, Dharan, Saudi Arabia. Middle of the night, I think it was 2 in the morning. Uh, there was no one to meet us. We just got off. We are on the flight line, uh, I think on a taxiway. We grabbed all our gear. We, made, uh, we just laid down and went to sleep. Uh, but I remember there were uh, jets taken off every three or four seconds. The, 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 the afterburners, wrong, just going, going. It was nonstop. That air war was uh, run like clockwork. Uh, and the maintainers and the uh, assets were put in place to do that were just incredible. And I, I think about 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, some, uh, some folks realized that we were out here sleeping in the middle of the airfield, that maybe that they need to collect us. So we then uh, moved off to different camps, and uh, I look back and laugh now, but there were a couple times we got scudded uh, right off the uh, uh, the little uh, pre-deployment camp. Uh, we got hit with a scud. Um, pretty exciting. Uh, there was a uh, time when we first got uh, there where they put us in a, um, a gymnasium, and then, uh, of course, at 2 in the morning, the alarms were going off, and uh, you know everybody's getting in their gas masks and stuff. And uh, I guess at the time, uh, uh, there were uh, swimmers in the water, which we call them, uh, trying to infiltrate. Uh, so there was a uh, uh, protection detail going on, an effort to uh, clear the waterway, uh, which was close to where we were housed. Uh, and then next morning, we were bussed out uh, to another location. And eventually, we ended up in the desert, uh, just dragging our bags, doing the bag drag. Everybody is uh, known and loved. Uh, we we uh, got to a, a, a Ford operating base, which uh, housed the uh, um, elements of the uh, quarter calf, of the uh, first infantry, the big red one out of Fort Riley. And I remember getting there that when it was night, when the sun went down, light was turned off, there was no illumination, it was dark, and the stars were plentiful. It was, it was amazing. Uh, however, we're still in the middle of war, and all you can see at night, you can see the lights uh, going, and then all of a sudden they blacked out because they're going across the border, uh, blackout ops. We uh, got introduced to our, our new parents, if you will. I uh, got inter indoctrinated into the unit, and uh, from there we uh, trained and, and, and got uh, acclimated to that unit's uh, mission, which was a cavalry, which is reconnaissance and uh, or attack. 
uh, staying away from more of the attack, I mean, you always want to defend yourself, but you want to recon and, and um, act as the eyes and ears of the division commander. So that's what we are in front of. We are part of 5th Corps. Uh, we were in the southern region, the 18th Airborne Corps that did the other end, higher end sweep. Um, funny things happen along the way. I'm sure this is kind of like a novel. It was said in a movie or a mm -hmm. novel. Um, one of the things uh, I was fortunate, uh, the Warren Officer Corps is very small. Uh, people I served with in Germany before the Berlin Wall fell uh, were there. So we had uh, mutual respect and, and uh, understanding. And we had CAV tactics and attack helicopter tactics, so it was it was nice to have a good mix. Um, so, getting to the the nuts and bolts of it, uh, one day the war kicked off. Uh, we never knew. Uh, we had an inclination to like they had a five days before it was like a complete maintenance stand down. Everybody, check your gear out. You know, rock drills, gears. You know, everything was being overlooked. Every uh, not overlooked, but just reviewed, taking a look at. You got everything. You know to nauseam. And then one morning we woke up, uh, it was gray, gray clouds, and I was sitting at this uh, location, and the Army has these MRLSs, which were tracked vehicles with uh, uh, rocket launchers, and, and, and they're um, uh, like the artillery is the king of battle. They're, they're part of that uh, family, and they're, 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 they're to prep the battlefield to send our, uh, our troops into harm's way. And, and there was, I, I imagine, maybe a battalion or a brigade, but these things were just cooking off, going left and right, and their trajectory weren't all like a, they were all guided. It was very systematic. It was uh, fascinating to watch that this technology could be in place, but it was trying to help us to, to make sure that we uh, were successful in our mission to uh, liberate Kuwait and uh, the atrocities that uh, we soon found out were happening after the war. The funny thing about it, it was exciting. I mean, I remember this uh, private first class. He had his cav hat on, and he was blowing charge. And the Cobras were lifting off and going. Since we weren't uh, original members, we uh, basically uh, had to go second place. You know, the guys, well, they were there longer. They're the unit. Let's let them go, and, uh, you know, that's their rights. They've earned it. Uh, it, it was wonderful to see. They came back. Uh, they they moved so fast so far uh, as the history will dictate. It was uh, very very uh, unnerving. I mean all the hype, uh, all the uh, the forty, fifty, sixty thousand caskets from different companies being uh, pre-purchased. You know it was going to be the wars of all wars. We were going to lose a hundred thousand, uh, and we were plussed up and and going to know going in that environment knowing that it was uh, kind of strange. However, uh, first day worked out good. Second day, uh, uh, some of my cronies, we got to, to fly in the unit, and we ended up going so far, we sat on the ground, and there, we, we met our objectives. We went to our phase lines, and there was nothing to do. So we waited for follow-on missions to assist other uh, left or right flank and trying to figure out what was going to happen. Well, we eventually uh, had to come back. Um, I happened to... Uh, Asked my uh, troop commander, you know, if this ops tempo keeps up and we're going to be here for, for months, why don't we fly two days on, two days off, two days on, two days. Try to get some tempo going to where you can, you know your uh, rhythm, you can plan. Uh, the people who are going to fly the next day, you, you can actually try to foresee what's going to happen and, and, and use your intelligence as it develops. Well, the next day, you know, he said, great. Next day we took off. Little uh, did I know that the whole division was lifting up and moving. So um, at the end of the war, there's uh, four or five days later, there's some pretty upset folks because us guys from Fort Drum, we took the mission to the uh, enemy and, and uh, they were in the trucks following us. Uh, it, it, but it was the luck of the draw if it's luck. Um, you, you never want to wish that on anybody to have to experience. But we, uh, uh, some of the exploits were um, scary, exciting, fascinating. Um, putting to test all the training you've uh, uh, had. Uh, there was no navigation. Uh, the desert's flat. You had maps. You did the best you could. And we kept on track. Um, the weather was uh, very bad. I remember one day uh, uh, 
actually the, the weather was bad for a lot that the, the ceiling and you know helicopters we don't we're not fast we can't get above it uh, without uh, a lot of safety so we stay low in it with what we can see and uh, ceiling was like 75 feet 100 feet but we still pressed did the mission well below minimums but we had the um, young troopers leading the way we are supposed to be the eyes and ears for them we didn't let them down we kept pressing um, at night, we'd land. We'd outran our logistics where we had to, uh, we land next to a, uh, a tanking unit, uh, M1 tanks. They had JP-8. JP-8 was the fuel of choice. Uh, uh, we got resupplied um, on the fly. Next day, we picked up, continued the mission. Uh, at night, we'd circle the helicopters and do our own perimeter security. Uh, interesting things happening, a lot of noises you couldn't see. Uh, you didn't know which way the war was going, uh, and it was uh, pretty uh, pretty exciting because uh, you're out there by yourself. That's all you have. Uh, and I, I think in your time back in Vietnam, you understand what it means to be out there hanging it. I certainly do, Colonel. Uh, we haven't we've given short shrift thus far to your Air Force career. Maybe Good. you can get into great. You know, I'd, I'd I'd love to hear your stories about the Army forever, but. Uh, uh, we want to give uh, thank you. Th the balance of your career a, a shot at it as well. Well, thank you for keeping me on track. Um, <laughs> like, like, like we, we spoke about, uh, I have a, a mixing bowl of uh, career opportunities and, 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 and course changes. Uh, after I became an officer in the United States Army, I decided that uh, the Army was restructuring their aviation assets, um, and it wasn't going to present a, 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 a safe haven or a location uh, for me to continue flying and staying in the same neighborhood. So I had a friend from the Army who was uh, serving the Air Force and asked him, if, how, what's the inter-service transfer like? He goes, there's a vacuum void. You can get in with your credentials. <coughs> we need helicopter pilots. Uh, things are cyclic. They let people go. They rehire. They let things go. Uh, and we were at the trough where they needed bodies, uh, qualified bodies. So at that point in time, I made a decision to do an inter-service transfer. I uh, hopped from the Army to the Air Force. I didn't uh, have one day of missed service. One day I woke up with my Air Force uniform, got sworn in, and then I went to, into the Air Force. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, the Air Force saw uh, the wisdom in taking Army people and put, uh, putting in special operations. Uh, special operations uh, is a, a cross-culture. All the servants, uh, service components have a uh, facet uh, that uh, feeds into the Special Operations Command. Uh, with their specialties. Air Force has helicopters uh, and they have fast movers. They have all kinds of different air assets they can bring uh, to bear in conjunction with other specialized uh, assets. Well, uh, I, I got into the Air Force. I went to Kirtland, did my uh, uh, SEERI training, which was your survival, uh, your escape, mm -hmm. your resistance, your uh, evasion type of training, your water survival. Uh, the schoolhouse was, oh God, uh, a year, year or so long, it, uh, in the career, the 30 plus year career of the Pavlo helicopter, which is the MH-53, uh, there's only uh, 200, maybe maybe 300 pilots in the whole history. Who've, done, who've who, flown this, yes, uh, uh, this uh, who Pavlo? Got, yes, the helicopter. Yeah. Very small community, um, very long uh, training uh, to to get certified to go out there to learn, if you I, will. I understand you have a picture of the Pavlo. Yes, uh, uh, let's bring it up. Um, okay. it's, it's a beach shot. And the film clip. Okay. Uh, also, we have a film clip, um, some uh, exploits during um, our Afghanistan time during 2002, early stages. This is a helicopter making a infiltration uh, uh, at a site um, in Afghanistan. Um, as you can see, the helicopter had a, hit, a, hit a dust out. This is all at night uh, under night vision goggles. Uh, the pilot is totally consumed with dust and almost every landing was like this. Um, and that big cloud of what uh, looks like smoke is dust. It, it's talcum powder light wow. dust. And you cannot see the flare uh, we had uh, gunship support uh, that evening, uh, and the pilot pulled out. Uh, he's flying around. He's going to go back and land back into it. Um, and the second go, pilot got it in, uh, troops off, 
uh, mission complete. Uh, often it was like that, and you have to understand in that high altitude, um, even the little LZs with confined uh, escape routes or uh, uh, in route uh, in route uh, routing uh, presented the t same type of um, dust out conditions mm -hmm. uh, every night. Um, Afghanistan was different. Uh, this was more of special ops. Some of the things that we used to do in special ops that we, we would train for a myriad of different um, uh, uh, type of uh, uh, mission sets, mm -hmm. problem solving mission sets. And a lot of them uh, were infiltration, exfiltration, where you'd bring in uh, troops, uh, you would conduct uh, operations on the battlefield, and you'd turn around. Uh, when their mission was done, you pick them up while the fight was going on. I also have another clip for this. Here what you have is a, uh, again, the MH-53 payload coming in uh, on an infill. Uh, under night vision goggles, uh, you're, you're seeing a lot of uh, tracers, uh, rocket fire. On occasion, you'll see uh, AC-130 uh, gunship support. Uh, shooting a 105 howitzer cannon down at the uh, battlefield. Right there you see the troops exiting the helicopters uh, while all this chaos is going on because we are affecting uh, the battlefield for that small piece of real estate. We're going, it's a surgical strike. So you can strike. get your helicopters in, your troops off, and your helicopters so, out and then, while everyone else is hopefully ducking their heads. Right, yes sir, and, and, and you see that they're uh, they now they're well, we're going out right now. We're going to go get some more gas. We're going to get some uh, air refueling. Uh, get behind a C-130. Get some gas and come back uh, and loiter and, and come back. Right now, you see we're going to do the exfil. Uh, there's some time lapse depending on every operation. You, you don't know what the uh, time lapse will be. You, you try to um, choreograph it uh, as to the threat that's there. So uh, you've got uh, two helicopter uh, exfil going on, a little bit dark. Um, How many troops are you picking up in, in something like this? Is this 15 to 20 per, per it, helicopter? Um, each mission will dictate what you're going to pick up or what you're going to put in. Uh, what is the nature of the assault, the objective of the battlefield, and again, the altitude, right. the terrain. Uh, are you up at mountain range where you have to trade off uh, power? Fuel to get the people in. Uh, are you, are and your troops coming in. Right? Yeah, my our, our lovely crunchies. Call them the crunchies. They're coming in. Uh, job well done. Um, as you can still see, uh, there's uh, to the right. There's uh, activity going on on the uh, objective. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still those would look, look like sparks above the rotor. What 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 is that? Oh well, the rotor is kicking up all kinds of dust. And that is the static electricity of this dust being sucked into the rotor system and igniting. Uh, under night, you, you don't see that, but night vision goggles, you do. Um, and then you can see some uh, fire support for our exfil. We're about to lift off, and, and you have uh, other aircraft uh, peppering the battlefield to uh, make sure that we try to uh, escape with uh, a little recourse. Uh, to us. And certainly, uh, and, and we've seen it in those brief clips, uh, the technology that has been brought to bear uh, to the, you know, on the service over the past number of years, uh, uh, I marvel at, uh, you know, and that's a, a big piece of it, and I know you're intimately involved in that, and I think it's, it's uh, very important and uh, certainly gratifying. And, uh, seeing some of the advances not only in weaponry but uh, the guidance of weapons uh, instead of just shooting for a grid square which is a thousand meters by a thousand meters yes, sir. we're shooting down the uh, some of those famous pictures with general schwarzkopf sure. walked, walked us through of bombs going down uh, the roofs or the chimneys of uh, the vents, buildings yes. and things of that nature uh, certainly that's a, uh, equally as important as some of the collaboration between the services Yes, sir, Dick, I, and, and I think that the important thing is that, uh, I, again, um, when, when our, our leaders uh, put us in harm's way, they don't do it because they, they, they want to. There's some underlying reasons that I'm sure the public will never know or understand or the news media will never uh, understand or, or play it out correctly. However, 
the point is we, we try to do it in, in keeping uh, collateral damage to the minimum and, and, and to hold those responsible responsible. It is not okay to go out and, and uh, eradicate a, 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 a certain group of people by virtue of their uh, either being male and they're uh, 14 years old or above. Mm -hmm. it, it certainly is not okay to um, systematically burn out uh, people and push them into another country. It, it's not okay to do those, and America values don't stand for that. Uh, unfortunately, we seem to be a, a world power, and uh, we seem to have a, a moral compass that draws in our allies. And, and that, unfortunately, uh, for some, is hard to take, but necessary. Uh, a world with, in chaos is not a safe place for your children or my children. And well, we, uh, we certainly uh, are delighted that you've been able to join us for these two sessions. Thank Dan. you. Uh, uh, a lot of us will rest a lot easier knowing that you're, uh, you're in command and in charge and, uh, in this service uh, uh, today and, and helping us uh, for the future. And for those of you out, out there in the, in the audience, again, this is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Pincava of the U.S. Air Force, who over the past two sessions has shared his experiences, both uh, half his career in the Army and the balance of his career in the Air Force. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back again with full birds on your shoulder instead of those, those nice shiny oak leaves, uh, uh, and, and wish you the well, well and the balance of your career. Uh, once again, this is Dick Gooding, and uh, this is Veterans Remember, and uh, we're signing off now with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Pincava. Dan, sir, thank you very much. Thank for you your for your time. time. Yes, sir. Thank you.